today changes my whole entire life. Welcome to Gridability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen. With me in the studio today is the beautiful and ever radiant Ro Clausen. Hello, I'm excited to be back. I feel like I've been missing the studio for a couple of weeks. And I think this is my first in person, we have an in person guest in this room. And I can't think of anybody better to have my first first in person podcast with. Say that ten times fast. Yes, well, you did it beautifully as always. Uh, with us today here in the studio is my good friend Jonathan Machado. How are you, Adam? Thanks for having me. Hello, uh, man. We are so excited to have you here today, and. I really wanted to kick this off by um, as Ro and I were talking earlier about thinking back, it's been a couple years now that you and I have known each other. Right. Um, and what first came to mind is how we met. Unusual place for, you know, individuals like us having a shared background. Right. We met at a courthouse. Yeah, it was fun. It was... <laughs> <laughs> Not... Sounds like a blast. <laughs> yeah. It was an interesting invite. I was... Um reached out by a caseworker for from an organization regarding speaking in front of a panel for leadership las vegas regarding um i think it was criminal justice week Mm -hmm. right and they wanted some people to share their background um and i show up and i remember adam showing up early as usual right and and for some reason i said i'm pretty sure that guy's going to be on the panel too and sure enough, we sat next to each other. I, I heard a bit of a story, uh, very inspiring, right? Motivating. I shared my story, and it, we just naturally gravitated towards each other. Man, well, I was telling Ro about this in the car, and I don't know if I had ever really shared this part of it, but that day when we were, you know, sharing our stories, sitting on that panel, uh, there's still times where I get a little bit nervous you know, greatest fear I ever had to overcome was public speaking. Mm. And in order to do the things that I really wanted to do, it was something that I worked on very hard. But being in that room for, as you said, for leadership, Las Vegas, like, you know, these are people who are prominent people within this community. I mean, movers and shakers, right? right? And we're up there, you know, being completely vulnerable, opening up, sharing our stories. And I don't think I ever told you this, but when I was listening to your story, man, it touched me in, in a way where I was like, I need to get to know that guy better. And it wasn't just what you were saying, man, it was the passion that you had. It was how authentic, transparent, like those are traits that when I see them in someone and they're genuine, like that's what I gravitate towards. I felt your energy and I was like, listen, before we leave here today, I got to get to know this guy. Right. Yeah, it was a a similar experience. Um, You had some insight that I was very unfamiliar with, right? What the struggles you faced, but seeing what you had overcome, right? And where you were today and how much you were determined to continue the good fight, so to speak, right? And and, um, advocate for reducing recidivism and reentry and and making, and oddly enough here in Nevada, right? In Las Vegas, it was uh, in, in my mind, what better place for me to be than right next to this individual that has this powerful story that's advocating or passionate about the same things that I am. So it was, it was pretty awesome. And it, I think what got us together was you work out and he's like, yeah, I do CrossFit. I was like, I'm down, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we did the Phoenix, we met John John and, and it was awesome. Yeah, we shared our visions, right? After a, after a CrossFit session with John John and, and I remember telling what I wanted to accomplish. You're like, man, that's very much uh, similar to what I'm trying to do on a much grander scale. I don't think you use those words, but I saw it, right? It was very much larger than what I had envisioned. But nonetheless, it was centered in, in being of service, 
to those that are in our position and, and carving that path, ensuring that they have a, um, um, a clear way to get, how would I say, not just a survive, but seeing that success is possible. Mm. Yeah. Well, that conversation that started on the courthouse steps, you know, after that event has continued. I mean, it's a couple years later. Yeah. We took it to the top of the mountain. We've been to all sorts <laughs> right. of different places. Uh, and those visions that we shared, man, in those couple of years, we've done some amazing things. And yeah. I really want to highlight, you know, the success that you've had. But I also want to let all of our viewers know, you know, where you came from. Because when mm -hmm. we talk about gridability, that's what it's all about overcoming those like incredible challenges. And there were some things that you shared with us recently when we were together that I didn't even know, things from your youth. Right. Yeah, so um, I barely knew how you guys met. I completely forgot. <laughs> and uh, when we were at your house recently, you were telling us a story about how when you were little, you had to, and I might be botching this, so I'm gonna need you to fix it, but you had to commute. Right. two different countries back and forth i believe you said between mexico and california right for school Correct. and you were telling this story and the way you articulated it was so beautiful about how um your parents tried to teach you that you had to kind of bend the truth in order to do this you had to say you were living with your aunt obviously they wanted to get you this great education but you also learned at a very young age that kind of like lying was okay and i believe i didn't let you finish telling that story in the moment because i made a joke and took it in a different direction because <laughs> that's what i do and i would love for you to not only tell that story but to kind of finish that story and explain mm. because like you have to be a very resilient person to do that as an adult let alone as a child day in and day out right it's um so when i started in the public school system i was living we were living in mexico in tijuana and we were going to a school in san diego and it was normal seeing my brothers get up for school i was so i was super excited to go to school and I remember my mom having the conversation with me and she's like, hey, by the way, there's certain things we need to discuss, right? Like, this is your address. Memorize this address, right? Memorize this phone number. And if anybody ever asks you, like, where you live, you tell them you live at this address, this phone number, this is where we work. And, and I'm thinking to myself, like, of course, I'm not questioning my mom, but bottom line, she's like, you need to say that in order to go to school or else they won't let you. Right. And she's like, and school's great. Right. You want this education? I'm like, yeah, right. I want to go to school. I want to be I want to be like my older brothers and, and participate in the same things they're doing. So in the moment. I knew it was uh, bending the truth, but there was a reward for it. Right. This education. So without them knowing, they um, instilled this idea in me being so young, impressionable that there's going to be instances where it's necessary, at least at that point in my mind, I thought that it was necessary that I'm going to have to bend the truth in order to, right, in this case, go to school or get those things that are worth getting. So I know thinking back, it was never their intention, right? Um, I believe they did the best they could with what they had available. And um, I'm fortunate now to look back at it and see where I possibly would have done things differently, right? Or, um, but nonetheless, it, it afforded me the opportunity to go to school in San Diego, and there was actually an incident where my brother commented to um, his friend that we were living in TJ, and a teacher overheard. <gasps> so they called us into the office, they pulled us out of class, they called my mom from work, and she had to come and, and mm. kind of say my brother was lying right or it was a joke and uh they checked they wanted um like bills to prove that we resided right so there's this there was this whole elaborate behind the scenes happening right for my family where my mom was paying like a phone bill her other sister was paying a different bill and they were all coming to the same address so that all of us can go to school in the u.s so um my mom managed to put their minds at ease right that we resided there and, and they allowed us to continue to go to school but it was like 
this is why you don't say it, right? And we came back, we would wake up 2 a.m. in the morning, and we, by the time we'd get home, it would be like 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and do it every day, Monday through Friday. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm like, as a mom, if it was the best thing for my son, I don't know that I would do it differently. I don't know. I, I can't answer that for you, but I can totally relate and not relate, but understand where your parents were coming from mm -hmm. because, I mean, it was an education for their children. I get it. Right. And <clears throat> thinking back, having faced some of the struggles I faced, I think to myself, like, man, my parents came if if the life that they wanted was attainable in their country uh, or their in Mexico, they would have not been or put themselves through what they went through just to get here, right? To ensure that their kids were born in this country so that they had access to insurance, to public schooling, right? In Mexico, the schools are all private. So when I was facing the struggles that I faced with um, a drug addiction and in and out of prisons, I thought to myself like, man, what, what a waste of their energy right that here i am like nothing to show for it um luckily uh, the light bulb turned on eventually right and here we are <laughs> well and, yeah i'm sorry go ahead no i always i mean adam and i have this conversation because of the amount of time that he spent is in prison as well and i think that it's that foundation that both of your parents built that allowed you to you know make your mistakes and be boys and and get yourself in trouble, but you were able to come out the other side and you're both living such beautiful lives. I mean, you have a beautiful you. fiance, a beautiful Thank family. You. Yeah. And I believe it's that foundation and those morals that were set by your parents at that young age mm -hmm. that helped you come back around to it. Because some people are often, they're still running in their forties, fifties, sixties. Yeah, you're right. It's, um, <clears throat> I'm super grateful. I understand now it's, even though to some people, my childhood might have been somewhat extreme. It fails in comparison to what my parents face as children, mm. which fails in comparison to what their parents face. So instead of trying to chase um, the villain, right, or find out who am I going to point the finger to, it's deciding, you know what, this is it. This is as far as that um, generational pain is going to go, and it's time to do something different. And that's exactly what we talk about. That is a gritty mindset because it's just your reframe and the way that you're, you choose to look at that. It's your perspective. And mm -hmm. I love that because how many people play the victim forever and they blame their parents right. for what they didn't have or, or whatnot. So I love that. You were going to say something. I was going to say most people do kind of to continue that. I love the whole Ed Milet, like yeah. be the one, mm -hmm. be the one in your family to, to change, like to change the entire trajectory of that right. lineage man and that's what i'm hearing that's what i see in you you Thank know you. what i mean like from the mm -hmm. moment that i you and i had this first conversation i mean i told you there was something that attracted me to you and like i'm not surprised at what you were able to overcome at a young age but i i am always curious like to know those defining moments to hear that story to me was like okay i get it but i'm sure there's other things like what else from your youth early on before you got caught up in, in everything else? Like, you know, Roe puts it very mildly that, you know, we were boys and got into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> right. <laughs> boys, you know, get called into the principal's office. Um, this was a little bit more dramatic. <laughs> I'm sorry, I called you boys. <laughs> well, I'm saying we've spent some, some time away, a little bit more extreme. So our mistakes were a little bit bigger. Mm. However... I'm sure there were some some moments, um, some defining relationships early on in your life that kind of molded you, made you who Absolutely. you were. Yeah, I, I remember one, um, I would say I was about, um, I would say like 10 years old, and my parents had bought their first house. We're now living in San Diego, and... Uh, my dad, he worked at the shipyard down in San Diego. And he came home one day. And, and as a child, right, your your parent is your hero, right? Sure. The sun rises because dad said so, you know? And and there's food on the table because dad makes sure there's food on the table. So one day I remember my dad coming home. And I told him, dad, when I grow up, I want to be like you. 
right? I want to work where you work. And he got upset and he looked at me and he's like, no, you can't do what I did. You can't work where I work. You got to be better. Mm -hmm. So unknowingly to him, he shattered that superhero image of himself to a child, right? Who was like, what do you mean, right? You are, you are the alpha, right? You're, you're the beginning and the end, right? Everything goes through you and you're telling me I need to be better. Well, wh where's my example, right? It's not you, so now I got to look for it outside of home. And that's where you start to, well, I started to look at, um, I like the saying goes, you don't choose your father, but you choose your father figure, right? So if my dad said I had to do better, well, what is better? I had to define that at a very young age. What, well, if I can't do that, then what do I have to do? And, and who's my role model, right? And um. And I found one, of course, in, in the worst place, right? But it was different than what was at home. But being the first generation uh, U.S. citizen, it was there was no rule book for the most part. Is like join the military, and that's what my brothers did, right? That, that's the that's the exit strategy. Like come to the U.S., join the military, and, and you're set. Uh, but there was there was nothing else. There was no. Um, no resources readily available, right? And uh, the only thing we had was this counterculture that was uh, wrongly idolized on TV, right? The Chicano culture or the gang culture. And and you gravitate towards that because, or at least I did, because I didn't fit in, so to speak. And my dad's telling me I need to do something different than him. <laughs> so uh, that's where that, that began, right? Very young, I would say 10 years old. Yeah. Wow. I love this. I love where this is going because I thought it was going to take a different direction when I asked that first question. That's why mm. I asked it. But I'm getting, just as a parent, I'm getting so much out of this episode. I love this. <laughs> well, I, I think we're getting to the point now where that transition happened. You're mm -hmm. outside of the house. You found the the wrong influence, right? Right. Um. Tell us where that was, kind of what happened and, and what set you off on the path that ultimately led to, man, so many years of additional struggle and challenge, which I'm sure that's not what your parents had in mind for you. Right. Definitely not. It's uh, so going back around 10 years old, despite being the first in our family, both in my mom and dad's um, sides of the family of who owned a home and, and lived on this side of the border, um, they looked at us like man, the world was ours, even though we faced a lot of struggles internally at home. My dad battling uh, alcoholism and poor financial decisions. So my mom got involved with full-time job. I mean, she always worked odd jobs. She'd clean people's houses, do things like that. And then, uh, when she noticed the 30 year mortgage, right? She's like, I need to uh, play my part that much more aggressively. And so she very much got involved in working and, and started taking hold of the finances. So I noticed a lot of the, the troubles at home stemmed from the lack of or misuse of money, mm. right? So in my mind, education served no purpose. I thought to myself, if I, if I had money, my mom wouldn't cry to sleep at night. You know, mm. if if there was money, then we didn't have to worry about, you know, um, what we're going to eat tomorrow. And uh, even though my parents um, did their best to ensure to try to hide that, I was the youngest. So I was just watching everything. Right. And um, I'm grateful for their struggle. But it, it, it sent mixed signals. Right. As a youth. So. um in that neighborhood in San Diego, I I saw the people who had money, right? And it was the ones doing all the things you, you shouldn't be doing. So I, I gravitated towards that. And um, I, I went from mowing lawns to selling drugs, right? Very quickly. And, and because it was more of a return on my investment, right? So that to me was security, was that money, right? Not education, despite uh, having teachers say, you know, you can, you, 
you really can, you, you can succeed in your education because they saw something in me in my, I was so focused on the right now, right? On the instant, uh, gratification, right? Of obtaining money and solving the problem. And it really led to more problems. Sure. And did you, this is going to sound like a bizarre question, but did you have success in that time where were you able to like help pay the bills or? Oh no, in no way was I able to disclose anything that I was doing to my mom. She was still very traditional Catholic raised, right? So, um, my brother, there was a distraction, right? And the distraction was the failing marriage between my parents Mm -hmm. that allowed me to operate under the radar, so to speak. And, um, I would still ask my mom for $20 on the weekend, even though I was, I had a means, I had to hold up appearances. Sure. So, um, it wasn't, I took it upon myself to, to feel as though I needed to do something. It was never asked of me. Right. And then in the end, it never went towards anything good. It never helped anybody. It just, um, set me on a path of a lot of struggle and a lot of pain. Yeah. Okay, so now you're involved with selling drugs and you're making a little bit of money and you said there was pain. Mm-hmm. Where was the downfall? The downfall would say uh, 22 years old, I went to the first time I was in custody. And um, in those, I did 45 days before I saw the judge or I saw the judge and they gave me like 30 days. In those 30 days, my parents had successfully finalized their divorce and sold the home. Wow. So here I am in um, in the county jail, downtown San Diego, and my dad visits me independently from my mom, and he's like, hey, this is going on. And he's like, but I'm with somebody. I said, well, good for you, dad, right? I'm happy that you're happy. As long as you're happy, you're always going to be my dad. You don't need to be with my mom to be my dad. And then separately, my mom and my brother came, and my mom's like, I met somebody. I said, good for you, mom, you know? And um, I was genuinely happy for them. Now, when I was released after that, 22 years of my life were in, in, in two trash bags, right? Those big, black, hefty, 50-gallon bags. And they're like, figure it out, right? Wow. And at that point in time, that was a pivotal moment. At that point, I could have rearranged my life, right? I had every opportunity to do so, but it was much more easy to do what I already knew how to do. Right. And stay in that world and, and um, use that as a crutch. Right. Like, oh, my parents left. or My dad wasn't there. Or he was an alcoholic or there was abuse and, and I don't have a home. And this is why I'm struggling. So I, I used every excuse. Right. Or I tried to hold on to everything instead of taking ownership and saying, you know, this is my life now and I need to take control of it. Nobody's going to come save me. Right. Like that's I'm an adult. I'm 22 years old. So. I wish I would have that would have happened. I don't regret it not happening, but did you feel like an adult at 22 years old? Cuz no. that's young, man. It's so yeah. young. No, not at all. I, it's funny because I I watch cartoons now because I feel like I didn't have a childhood. Wow. Yeah, like I missed out on so much. Like I watch anime. Um that's my my little refuge to myself. Like I won't watch um all the TV shows, right? The, the the drug trafficking and all that because they idolize something that really they know nothing about and it's just so painful, right? And seeing families impacted by the mafia that are kidnapping people. I've lost countless family members to that. So I choose to, it, it, it brings back a lot of hurt, right? So it, to me, it's, it's upsetting that they glorify it, right? But now I, I watch cartoons. I love that. And my last question in my phone, but I want to ask it now because I feel like it fits, is you've always come across to me as the eternal optimist. You always flip things positive when I hear you guys on the phone. Mm -hmm. And just exactly what you were saying about your parents, good for you, I'm happy you're happy. Where do you think you developed that? I would say it started at, at home, right? At home, despite what was going on around, there was a strong religious foundation, Right. Um, So there was I was introduced to a higher power very young and. Whether I chose to ignore that higher power, um, it was always there when I needed it. Right. And just this last time, 
what happened to me is is I was actually at CCDC awaiting sentencing and I was doing a prayer walk in the module. This is like 2 a.m. in the morning, right? And um, I'm talking to God and he's responding to me. And I remember telling him, I'm like, man, how come every time I'm here, I can hear you? Right? And, he, and he responded, he said, Jonathan, when you're in the world, you're of the world. Oh. Right? So you're more concerned with worldly things. And all I want is a relationship with you. So if I have to keep you here to have a relationship with you, I will. He said, well, I can hear you now. We don't got to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it. So, um, and I held on to that. I held on to that, right? And uh, thankfully, because I had that upbringing, despite everything that was going around, there was that, that religious foundation, right? The Catholic um, religion was there for me. So uh, that's what allows me to stay optimistic. Wow, what yeah. a beautiful story. And we're going to come back to this. But I just skipped a whole chunk. So <laughs> you did 30 days, but now yeah. you're in CCDC awaiting sentencing. Mm. What transpired in between? Oh, between there, um, I had a son, right? And that was that was an amazing experience. Um, I was 24 years old, had my first son, only son. And uh, I remember being, having that, that mindset that nothing is going to derail me from being there for my child, right? And then to think that what I would be willing to do to ensure that he had a life better than my own is almost scary, mm -hmm. right? Because there's nothing. And then um, I was in a relationship with my mother's son I was still very much of the world. I was still indulging, you know, smoking marijuana and, and drinking, um, trying to juggle both being a father, working a regular job, and that lifestyle, right? Um, thinking that was part of my identity. And as any sane person would, they'll draw the line, right? And uh, she did. She drew the line and said, you know what? You're continuing down a path that I do not want to see my son involved in right and uh that was the second opportunity that i could have changed my life right I, and instead i used it as a crutch right i said oh you know i blamed everything on on her taking my son and and uh because he was he was everything to me so i had now a new excuse and i held on to that um that led me back to prison Right, making uh, foolish mistakes involved in even heavier drugs because I now had a void that I couldn't fill. Mm -hmm. that, that's my child. And alcohol and marijuana were not enough. Right, So I went to uh, um, more, a heavier drug, right, a crystal meth, and it, it didn't fill the void. It just distracted me enough to continue. Yeah. Right, So land back in prison um, or in jail. I get out, I try to do the right thing, but, and these are the struggles that I noticed this last time around, right? Is there, there wasn't enough resources to help me transition, right? It's just like, here's your PO, you come in every 30 days, you pee in this cup and we'll see you, we'll see you in 30 days. So it was tough, right? Um, working minimum wage and then, uh, couch surfing between families and friends and, and no real support, nothing to lean on. So quickly it gets, you, you become, or at least I felt as a burden. So I didn't want to feel that. Excuse me. So you go back to what you think, you know, right. And what, what's safe, oddly enough, it was the most dangerous thing to do, but it was safe because it was my comfort zone. Yeah. Right. So, um, I ended up moving to south of the border in TJ where I um, linked up with the wrong crowd again and then I found myself in federal prison. And uh, in federal prison, I was sentenced for a attempted importation of illegal substance through the uh, port of entry and I'm there for a substantial amount of time 
thinking to myself, like, are you done? And as much as I thought I was, I, I wasn't. Right? Well, mm-hmm. Still some, some field research left to do, so to speak, right? Um, because oddly enough, you're there and you're, you're around some significant people in that world, right? Who have m- made significant impact in that underworld and they and they fill your head with these ideas like oh man you can still do this right and 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 i came out tried to do it again but i didn't have no real support it was just myself and that quickly that quickly led me back to what i knew and i came out with i came out to vegas with the sole intention of committing crime Right, that was the whole reason why I came out to Vegas, and then my higher power showed up one day with a gun and a badge. Right, uh, I'm Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and then that's where I had that prayer walk, and um, had the opportunity to finally, right, at 33 years old, make a decision to. I was done. My best ideas had gotten me there. I was, I was literally at the end of my rope, and. Um, I wanted something I never had. And I thought to myself, you know, I know how to fail pretty, pretty well. Actually, I'm six, I'm a successful failure. All right. But I've never succeeded. I don't know what that's like. Um, so if I died today, I can't say I've tried everything because the only thing I haven't tried is the right thing. Right. So if that fails, well, I know how to do that. So I, I don't have to be afraid of that. So I made my mind up to do something different and it's been the most amazing journey i've got to meet some amazing people and make an imprint in my community and help individuals right some twice my age some half my age right and uh, it, it's it's been amazing yeah. well i that was quite a, a summary of of time in there and i know that there was a lot that you went through during that period and I'm a firm believer in what we go through, we grow through. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's our experiences that shape us and make us who we are. And I've also seen that it takes something different for everyone, right? Like everyone gets to the end of that rope right. at a different point. The unfortunate reality is some people never get there. Mm-hmm. Um, but you hit that point, you make a decision, and I'm going to do things different where do you get your start? Because you said, and and I can totally relate about coming out and feeling like there's no support there. That's what led me right back to prison. Mm -hmm. So I understand that part. I came out this time with like unbelievable support. Obviously, Ro was literally most of the time holding my hand, right? Through that whole process. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine having gone through it and, and, Wow, as navigated it as successfully as I did without her. I just can't even conceive that. And then I had family. I had built other supports because I was in for a long time. So I attribute all of them with me becoming who I am today because I had that support system. So you didn't have that in the past, but you make this decision. I'm going to live a different way. I'm going to try something new. Tell me how that works out, because I know you as who you are now. Right. You're lucky. <laughs> Bless. Um, I got to say, Las Vegas, man, was... I never thought I was going to come here and accomplish the things I did, but oddly enough, um, the drug court program, because that's what gave me the opportunity to, to get out. Right, is I had openly admitted that I had a drug problem. Everything, all the crimes that I committed, whether um, at the time I acknowledged them or not, was to sustain my drug habit. Right, so I I had this moment of clarity. Right, without knowing, I worked my first step. Right, admitting that I was an addict, and um, the judge. And I wish I could have thanked her in person. Um, she's since retired. And I graduated during COVID, but she asked me, she when I went to sentencing, she was ready to give me four years due to my criminal past, right? Habitual criminal history. And um I remember saying, Your Honor, like I have a drug problem. 
She's all oh, really, are you interested in this intensive outpatient program? And I'm like, yes. Right. And it, it was a whole, it was a genuine, yes. Like I wanted something different. And, um, she said, okay, somebody will speak with you, right? We'll come back. We'll, we'll bench this and we'll come back. So I got interviewed while in custody and during the interview, I'm smiling and I remember being asked, like, why are you so happy? <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, cause this is another step closer to, um, you know, getting out of here and doing something different. So they gave me a new date, like for two weeks later. And then my public defender shows up two weeks later and he says, you know, your application has been denied. Oh no. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you have sales charges, right? You have uh, more than just possession you have sales charges. So this is for people who have an addiction problem. We're not trying to put foxes in the hen house it is, is the term they used. And I was like, Oh, well, you know, so what can I do? He's like, nothing. I just go see what the judge says. So we go in there and, and judge Ellsworth. I hope she doesn't get mad by me mentioning her name, but she sees me and she says, you know, you were denied. She said, but I have the final word. I, I am in charge of the specialty court program and something tells me that I'm going to give you a shot, you know, so I am going to have my eye on you, mm. right? Because due to your past, like you shouldn't, you don't fit the criteria, but I am going to give you an opportunity. So I said, thank you. Right. And I remember going back in and, um, you know, you have the, the county blues on and, and it's, it has the CCDC imprinted on the top and on the bottom. And I remember a guy telling me, um, he's like, you know what CCDC stands for? And I was like, what's that? He's like, can't complete drug court. Like, it's a setup. You're going to fail. So Ooh. I took that as a personal challenge, right? Like, you. you're not going to tell me I'm going to fail, right? <laughs> so I said, okay. Um, luckily, I would say right after the the holidays i was released in january and um i told myself all right man you're in a place you have no family here right you have uh all your family is is going to be skeptical of the change right because you've invested 30 years in becoming this person and now all of a sudden you're going to try something different so don't be surprised if you're not if they're not receptive to this new change right but lean into this program and uh, that's what I did. I came out with a, with an open mind, right? And they grafted a new idea. They said, you need support. You need AA or NA. You need a sponsor. You need to go to meetings. I said, okay. And I was willing. And um, it was a lot of walking, a lot of learning the bus system. But luckily... Right, Las Vegas has some great public transportation. They run every fifth, depending on what line, every fifteen minutes, right? And on the weekend, thirty minutes, as opposed to San Diego's, like every hour. Ooh. So, shout out to the RTC. Yes, for real. <laughs> RTC's doing a good job. We're They're looking doing a for great sponsors. Job, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I leaned, I leaned into the program. I found a sponsor. Uh, I worked steps, and uh, I showed up when I didn't want to. Right. But I kept telling myself, I want something I've never had. Or I need to do something I've never done. I kn and there was a possibility that I could succeed, right? Something I've never, again, something I've never had. So why not give it a shot? So I did. And uh, I progressed, and people were dropping like flies, sure enough, right? The people that weren't ready that they were just saying lip service just to get out of custody, they're quickly relapsed, right? And I played the tape all the way through. Like I know what that, where that would lead me. And I was just tired of that. That wasn't a life that I want to live anymore. So that made me more resilient. It gave me more grit and more determination to say, I know what's waiting for me on the other side of that. So I'm not willing, I don't know what's behind this door. Right? It can be a life uh, beyond my wildest dreams, and it has become that, right? Luckily, um, but, and I don't attribute that to luck. Actually, that's just faith in the process and, and doing your due diligence. So, yeah, I leaned in, and um, 10 days before graduation, I was working 
for a gentleman. And um, every morning it was a routine. You call the drug testing line, right? To see if your color has been called. And at the end of every night, I would recap my day, make sure I called who I needed to call. And, and they closed at nine o'clock. And that day I worked past nine, 10 days before my graduation. And um, I'm sitting in my car and it's 9.15 p.m. And I go through my recent calls and I was like, oh my God, I didn't call the drug testing line. I said, what are the odds of them having called my color today? Oh. And I called and they did. <gasps> so I, I missed, oh. <laughs> I missed it. And um, I said, okay, well, what can I do? There's nothing I can do other than show up tomorrow and test, right? Because it's, it's um, zero tolerance. You miss a UA, you get remanded. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to take the remand. I was prepared for that, but... What I didn't want them is to is to be questioned my sobriety. Mm. I wanted to go on record that I was clean, right? That it wasn't a relapse. It was just unfortunately, it escaped me ten days prior. So I went in, and um, Judge Ellsworth was upset because I went and tested when I shouldn't have, right? Because the court is paying for all of this. But um, she said, you know, thank you for doing that. Nonetheless. Um, we're going to remand you for 48 hours. Uh, when would you like to come and turn yourself in? This is the first time in my life I've ever been asked when I want to turn myself in, right? So I was like, well, how about this weekend? You know, and uh, she's like, okay. And I went and it was the first time in my life being in custody, uh, not under any t under the influence of anything. And it was a much different experience, right? It was very eye-opening um, where in the past, that initial intake process, I, I was always not in the right state of mind. It, it felt like, um, how can I say? Um, it it was combative, right? Because you're the you're the inmate, and then the CEOs they're the enemy, right? So it, it was very. I don't want to be here, and of course they know you don't want to be here. So you're fighting these guys, and this time around I went in and and. It was like, man, these guys are just doing their job. Like, this guy is ma probably married, has a family. Like, why am I making his life difficult, wow. right? And um, it was not a bad experience at all, actually, <laughs> right? I went in. I knew I was – what made it easy was that I knew I was getting out, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That that makes a huge difference because I knew Sunday evening I am going to be back, back home. Um but it, it was a fresh perspective, right? Because I didn't have all those, all that outside clutter, outside noise from the substances or that environment, that that um, culture, right? Counterculture that I was living with um, inside of me, clouding up my judgment. I do want to back up. I want to focus on that for a minute because being on intensive testing, that sort of supervision, uh, I don't think most people understand what it's like to live under that level of scrutiny, the stress that that creates. Mm -hmm. I know she does because again, she was holding my hand through that process. And when I got out here, I was on intensive uh, monitoring where sometimes it was a couple times a week. We actually just did a video about this. Man, that was stressful. For it, both of us. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. you knew it because she would be like, did you, did you call? Did you call and check today? And I'd be like, oh God, let me go. When you said go through my call log and there'd be times where it would like catch, I'd be like, oh my God, I forgot to call. And, and I'd be holding my breath like, God, don't let me have missed this. Don't let me have missed this. Getting off of that, being released from that testing was almost like getting out of prison. I bet. It was, it was that same level. I, you were right there with me. Well, I've never been in prison. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, <I'm> right. <laughs> so as you were telling me that, like I was right there with you and I'm like, oh man. And to have to go back for that 48 hours, your mindset, the way that you just acknowledged it, the way that you, your perspective over all of it, I want to highlight that. And I, and I also want to highlight the fact that even you ending up in that program is a result of you standing up there in those blues that said CCDC. Right. That judge saw something more. She mm. saw past 
that prison garb. She saw something in you. It's the same thing that I saw in you. And the reality is um, certain people just have a different energy. There's something within them that's different. Mm. And to acknowledge that you have it Thank you. and that it's being channeled now towards some amazing things. And I do want to kind of transition over to, because we talked about all the challenges, mm -hmm. but you said about being of service. And I'd really like to talk about that. Before you transition though, mm -hmm. I was going to say the exact same thing, but also I want to acknowledge your judge because if your judge, Adam's judge that uh, signed your compassionate release, they, there's a line in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. And Judge Ellsworth and Judge, I can't remember his name right now, Papert. Papert, sorry. Uh, they displayed empathy and compassion. Right. And they gave you your second chances mm. where that is, I mean, it can make me cry because that's huge. They did see something in you. Right. But also they, they saw just a person to a person, which is amazing. And real basic the fact that you turned yourself in over a weekend for 48 mm. hours just shows how far you had come out of your addiction because it right. was a weekend. Right. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to not forget that before yeah, we transition. Yeah. No, no, no. That was that was great. It was. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I didn't get the opportunity. We didn't have a formal graduation because uh, COVID happened mm -hmm. the following year. So I... I'll use this as my opportunity, right? Judge Ellsworth, I am extremely grateful for that opportunity. It, it has allowed me to be here today um, to accomplish things I didn't think possible. And it was thanks to you seeing that in me and giving me that opportunity. And, and the district court, right, drug court, that program, um, I'm super grateful for it. And, and it's that acronym, Can't Complete Drug Court, is for those that don't want it. Right, because if you wanted the resources in Nevada, they have them, right? And it, it's very possible. And you just got to want it. So thank you again, Judge Ellsworth. And we'll make sure she gets that because yeah. we have a former judge who listens to the podcast. Nice. So. We're, yeah, we're definitely going to pass that along. And to Judge Ellsworth, what are you most proud of accomplishing since completing that program? Mm. Most proud of accomplishing... So I used that program, the fact that I was in that program as a, a, a level of accountability that most people didn't have when I was applying for, for work, right? So I would, went, I would go to these interviews and I would disclose my background and then I tell them, look, man, I'm the I have a level of accountability that far exceeds Joe Schmo, right? Like I have a caseworker, I have a probation officer, I have a judge, I have a sponsor, I have all these things that are holding me accountable to ensure that I succeed, right? Like you are not gambling by bringing me into your organization. You're you're getting a candidate that has this this level of respect for themselves, right? And has to answer not just to you, the employer, right? But to all these other agencies, right? And organizations and it, I would use that as a sales point, right? And it was true though. It was, it was pretty awesome. I love that. Well, I, I know because I've been there to see you in the workplace, mm -hmm. the people that you lead, the respect that you have from all of those uh, who are within your care, like in the workplace and in life, I've always been very, very impressed with that. Thank you. I know a lot of people who watch, you see the books back here. You know, I've had a lot of books that have influenced me. I know that you are very much in line with me on that. If you had to pick one book, what book would that be? Extreme Ownership. Okay. Um, By? Jocko. Willenink. There Willink. you go. Yep. I'll, I would have butchered his last name. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was... I didn't know he had a last name. <laughs> <laughs> he really doesn't. You can just, you know. Right, Jocko, yeah. There was a lot of books before that, but that specific book in regards to leadership, right, was quintessential in, in, in ensuring that I showed up well for those that I was, I was leading, um, helping manage, right? There, there's such a huge responsibility, and, and that would be one of my biggest accomplishments since, since drug court, would, to be in a position of leadership, 
right? Where others' uh, success and um, were intertwined with my own, right? So that book gave me something um, that I've heard a million times, but the way he the way he worded it using combat experience, right, and relating it to business. It's like, oh my God, this totally makes sense, right? And uh, just owning, owning your space, owning your, owning your uh, destiny, right? Owning your mistakes, owning your victories as well, right? And then sharing that with those around you, <clears throat> humanizing myself, right? To ensuring that I'm not on this pedestal where I, I'm above, right? Um, that, and that's been an amazing book for sure. I was going to say, you've not only, I've seen you, you know, within the success that you've had, not only within leadership, but also within ownership. I, I'm excited because I think that we're going to have a big announcement here shortly. I, I see great things for you in the future. So your leadership journey, I believe, is only just beginning. But I also want to highlight the fact, your ownership. Mm. As an entrepreneur, right? like I said, like I, I definitely want to highlight that. <laughs> Because you're not only an owner, it's about you being of service, using yes. your, your experiences. Tell us about that. Yeah, so while in drug court, I noticed there, there was a portion of that where I was living in um, a transitional living facility. And uh, there was another gentleman that was actually going through the program at the same time I was. We didn't know each other yet, but he was in a different facility. And the way it was managed, it, it felt as though, like I understood the comments, right? What well, can't complete drug court, it made sense to me because there was, we were sardine jam-packed into these living quarters, right? And um, with all these demands or expectations on us with no real support, right? So I said, man, we, and then I'm hearing numbers, right? Like what, what they're charging. Uh, for instance, the organization I was with, they, they made it seem as though they were there to help. So the grant funding allowed for paying for the housing for the first initial 120 days for the participant in the specialty court program. After those 120 days, the, the goal is that you're pretty self-sufficient or at least well on your way to you know pay your own rent. So this organization I was in, they, um, I remember they, there would be people that maxed out their grant funding and they would say, oh no, don't worry, they, you can stay here until you, until you find, you know, employment, don't worry about it. And um, they would rack up these charges or, or expenses, right? This, I, I believe it was $925 a month. Ooh. Yes. Okay. To share a room between four people in one room. Yeah. And um, a room designed as a seat for one person yeah. right, is now for four. And uh, after like 30 days, they're like, so are you going to pay? So, well, I haven't found my job. And they would use that as leverage against you. And they would mm. even go to the courts and put you on noncompliance. And people would even go back to jail. Oh, man. Right. So I was like, oh, my God, this is this is not where I want to be. So I quickly, myself, I found employment and I moved out before my grant funding ran out, mm -hmm. um, luckily. But I saw that it could be done better being in a, you don't want to leave an institution to go into an institution, mm -hmm. right? You, and um, if the goal is to make me a productive member of society and transition into society, then I need that, that safe space to do that. So, um, while in drug court, I met this amazing individual, um, who we would ride the bus together to go drug tests to ATI. And I remember sharing a little bit of background about myself. He shared a little background about him and about himself. And then I told him I had this idea, right. Of, of getting involved in, in three quarter housing. And he's like, Oh yeah, that would be a great idea. And, um, I said, yeah, man, I got the business plan written up and just, I, I know, I realized that I couldn't do this alone, right? So 
are you interested? He's like, yeah, that's definitely something we can do. Let's establish ourselves. And he did. He established himself. I established myself. And we ended up starting our own business, uh, eFit Village. And we now run multiple three-quarter housing where we house individuals that are transitioning both from prison or treatment yes. to help them get back into society. Yeah, and I remember it, it's we're going on our second year, um, October. It's funny how it happened one day. We were actually managing another home, and uh, we were about to get displaced. And I remember my partner, because he's not my business partner, Kalani, and uh, he's like, I'm ready. I said, okay, let's do it, right? Because he was frustrated because we were, we had opened one facility and, and did it well. We, then the owner of that facility asked us to do it again. We did that well. And he was getting ready to uh, do it again. And he's like, man, we could do this for ourselves. He's like, I'm ready. I said, perfect, let's do it. And we jumped in head first, <laughs> right? And, uh, it's been successful and we're going, this is our second year in operation. And, um, it's been an awesome experience cause I get to deal with individuals that were like me, right. In these specialty core programs. And, uh, I interact with them and we get to sit down, break bread with them. And, and when they, they come with their hangups or their hurts, you can relate to them. And then when they realize that you, you went through what they're going through, <clears throat> You see the light bulb go on. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I can do this. Like, yeah, you can. I did it. All right. He did it. We both did it. And when they come, like, oh, it's because you don't understand. Like, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was literally there. Like, yeah. I, I do understand. Now, here's here's what we have to help, but you got to want it. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, we've been fortunate to meet some amazing people. And uh, Kalani is, is an amazing partner, best friend. He, he's soon to be best man at my wedding, right? Uh, Congratulations it, yes. on that as well. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Um, so it's been a great experience, and it's the same vision I shared with you, right? At, at yep. When we, after that CrossFit session with John John, I was like, one, two, three quarter housing. And here we are two years into it. And you're doing it, man. Yeah, and thank you. That's. To see it come full circle, I love that we're coming back to this because I did want to highlight that. That's the vision that you shared. Right. And you're doing it, man. And I have to, it's like screaming in my head to say this to you because as gritty, resilient people, a lot of times we don't see our successes because we're like on to the next thing, right? And going all the way back to the story with your dad telling you, no, you need to be more successful than me. And you misinterpreting that or interpreting mm -hmm. that however you did in your mind at that young age. And then going after those drug dealers, those were the su successful people in your mind that you needed or you thought at that right. time that you needed to emulate in order to make your father proud or to be successful. But little did you know, right? Because it's like hindsight is twenty twenty. Little did you know at that time, this was setting you up Right. For all of these years, you had to go through all of that to become the success, to do what you were meant to do, full circle what you're doing now, sitting in that prison cell thinking like, I was never a success. I was never, I never made myself proud, but mm -hmm. that was all setting you up for this. Like right. I have chills thinking about how full circle that is. And that's not only, like I know your dad's proud of you now, and I hope that you're proud of yourself for what you've done. That's a lesson for everybody to take away because in our moments of pain that's where we can we can use that to connect with people some buttoned up mm -hmm. you know person who's running let's say a rehab facility or a house just to make money they're not going to connect with the people in the way that right. you can and they can change their lives the way you did and i'm so proud of you thank you yeah thank and you you are you're you're not just a credible messenger you're a credible leader uh i feel fortunate to call you a friend Thank you. Likewise, yeah. man. And I am so excited to see what your next success is Yes, because I know, I know that that vision just continues to expand. I'm excited to be on this journey with you. I think it's going to take us on a few more hikes, a few more mountaintops <laughs> along the way. Definitely. Yeah. So I'm excited for all of that. It's been great having you here in the studio. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
We appreciate you. I know that we've got all your info. We're going to blast yes. that out. We even got your number on here. So yes. anybody that's looking in the Las Vegas area to get into three-quarter housing, please, this is where you want to be. Definitely. This is definitely it. So we want to give you a big shout out. Thank you for coming in today. Absolutely. It's been another incredible episode of Gridability. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen, Ro Clausen, Jonathan Machado, signing off. We'll see you back here on the next episode. Bye, guys.